Should we start? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Hi and welcome everybody to the last session of this excellent, excellently organized virtual meeting of the IGCP project. And um, our next speaker is um, just we. You are muted. Um, our next speaker is Amalia Penny, and she will talk about marine substrate changes in biodiversity in the Order Vision. And it's apparently a pre recorded talk. So, um, yeah, have fun, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia Penny, and I'm a postdoc at the Finnish Museum of Natural History here at the University of Helsinki. And for the last little while, I've been working on a project with Bjorn Kroger called. Um, ecological engineering as a biodiversity driver in deep time, which might give you some idea of the direction I'm going in with this talk. Since this is a longer talk, um, I'm going to present the results of uh, two studies that we've done uh, as part of that broader project on diversity patterns and substrate change in the Baltic Paleo Basin in collaboration with Ole Hintz, and the other um, a study of middle order vision reefs from the Mingan Islands with Andre de Rocher. So without further ado, so as we all know, the Ordovician was a time of considerable change to marine substrates. Um, and among those changes were increases in the extent and thickness of shell beds uh, and also changes in shell bed composition. Uh, the expansion of metazoan dominated reefs and the rise of these new um, reef building uh, consortia of metazoans. Also an expansion in hard substrates and the development of uh, hard substrate communities. And the aspect I think has received the most attention in recent years is this issue of uh, increasing bioturbation depth and the increasing diversity of bioturbation traces. And the main reason why I'm so interested in this issue of substrate change, and the thing I think draws a lot of us to it, is um, this link with this idea of ecosystem engineering. So all of these changes in substrates, or many of them at least, are um, examples of modifications to the environment made by life. And the thing which I think personally I'm really curious about is how those modifications uh, fed back onto life itself. So the feedbacks between life and environments at this time when marine ecosystems were becoming so much more complex. So before I go further, I just thought I'd introduce this idea of ecosystem engineering in a slightly more uh, formal way so we know where I'm coming from. Um, ecosystem engineering as a concept was formalised in the 1990s by Clive Jones and colleagues. And they defined it as modifications to the abiotic environment by one species that affect resource availability for another species. Um, and right from the beginning, there was uh, uh, quite a lot of interest in the possible impacts of ecosystem engineering on macroevolution or long-term evolutionary patterns. Um, the diagram I took from a, an influential review on this subject by Doug Irwin and Sarah Tweet um, from 2012. And what this diagram is showing is that species one, which is an ecosystem engineer, is having an impact on its environment, which has spillover effects on species two, which is another species that shares its community. So on very short timescales, um, this ecosystem engineering by species one is modifying the selection pressures on, on both species one and on species two. And in the long term, if the modifications to the environment that species one makes uh, persist beyond its own lifetime, um, this ecosystem engineering is creating a, a sort of parallel inheritance or an ecological inheritance that runs alongside the, the genetic inheritance of these two species. And over long timescales, what you get is um, both a feedback from the environment onto um, species one, uh, known as niche construction, uh, and also the spillover effects uh, that can operate in the long term on species two and modify its, um, modify its evolution. And one of the questions about this, this long-term impact of ecosystem engineering that I think interests a lot of paleoecologists is, is how it might have contributed to diversification or to diversity patterns over long timescales. Um, and that's really the question that, that got Bjorn and me interested in this project um, some time ago. So ecosystem engineering quite often involves uh, these complex collections of ecological interactions, and those are rarely preserved in the rock record. But what I think can preserve more often is uh, the habitat or substrate heterogeneity uh, generated by ecosystem engineers. So here are two examples of that. Um, ecosystem engineers can produce this large scale heterogeneity. You've got a benthic habitat map from an island off Honduras. 
Um, and what you can see here is that various kinds of benthic ecosystem engineers are contributing to this complex habitat mosaic um, in the shallow marine environment. Ecosystem engineers also generate smaller scale heterogeneity. So on the right, you've got a, a photo transect through a, a section of coral reef. And what you can see is that all the different species of corals uh, that inhabit that reef are producing uh, uh, differences in rugosity, so the roughness of the surface. And not only is that rugosity itself uh, a form of habitat complexity because it generates many different microenvironments, uh, but the differences in rugosity from, from one species to another are also creating this patchiness or this heterogeneity on the reef surface. So we decided to focus on environmental or substrate heterogeneity um, in the early stages of this project. So this idea of um, habitat or substrate heterogeneity is really at the heart of this project. Um, and as I said in this talk, um, I'm going to present results from, from two studies. One, one study that looks at this heterogeneity at local scale, uh, based on some Darrow William reefs from the Mingan Islands in Quebec. Um, and the other looks at uh, basin scale substrate changes um, from the Baltic Paleo Basin. So I'm going to start with that regional scale story. Um, as you probably all know, uh, over the Ordovician, uh, Baltica underwent this shift from relatively high latitudes uh, towards the equator at a time of global cooling. And what that meant uh, was that in the Baltic Paleo Basin, you got this shift from cool water carbonate deposition into warm water carbonate deposition and the development of this tropical carbonate shelf. And this is just a, a little cross section of that carbonate shelf development uh, in the Eastern Baltic Paleo Basin. Um, and the real research questions that we had uh, for this project were how the development of that carbonate shelf might have influenced diversity patterns uh, through substrate change. And over the course of the project, as you'll see, we also came up with this uh, subsidiary question um, about how these diversity patterns might be influenced um, by temporal change as well. So often when you work with diversity patterns and you want to test uh, hypotheses about where your diversity is coming from, it's useful to partition the total diversity you're looking at, or the gamma diversity, into the within sample or alpha diversity um, and beta diversity components. And beta diversity can be measured in a huge range of different ways, but it's generally a measure of, uh, in some sense, how different your uh, alpha diversity, uh, your samples are from each other. And for this study, we've adopted this hierarchical um, diversity partitioning scheme. Um, and what this means is that uh, for each uh, sample, so we've, we've defined a formation as our basic sampling unit. Um, what this means is that the, the beta diversity is defined by the number of additional genera uh, you get when you uh, group together your, your, uh, your samples or your formations into increasingly large groups. Um, and this is what's called uh, additive diversity partitioning, uh, where the, the regional or gamma diversity is the sum of uh, your mean uh, within sample or alpha diversity and a number of beta diversity terms. And effectively, the way this works uh, is if you have your within sample alpha diversity uh, and you group all of these samples together uh, because they share a rock type. And in, in our case, we, uh, we divided our samples up into uh, carbonate and siliciclastic rock types because we were interested in um, beta diversity within, within those different uh, lithologies. Um, the, the beta diversity B1 is the increase in diversity you get when you group all these samples together. So if you have a high B1, it means that there's a, a lot of difference uh, in the composition of the assemblages within these samples. Uh, what you can then do is group your rock types together. So group your, uh, in our case, your carbonates and your siliciclastic rock types together. Uh, and that gives you your second beta diversity term. So this is how much, uh, how much difference there is between carbonate and siliciclastic rock types. And we adopted this hierarchical scheme for a few reasons. Um, one reason why it's useful is that it allows you to see uh, at what level uh, most of your regional diversity is being generated. Um, so you don't have a single beta diversity term, you really can divide up um, which types of beta diversity are contributing the most uh, to your regional gamma diversity. The other nice thing about it is you can uh, adapt it to, to use with different diversity indices. So you can use richness uh, which focuses often on the rare species, uh, but you can also use the Simpson or Shannon uh, indices, uh, which emphasize the more common species in an abundance distribution. And the other nice thing, of course, is that you can group your sampling units together in whatever way you want. Um, and so you can also use these kinds of hierarchical um, partitioning schemes to look at the impact of temporal turnover on your data. And that's something that I'll be doing later on in this talk. So in this study, we decided to focus on brachiopod uh, diversity data. 
um, largely because they've got a fantastic fossil record um, from the Baltic Paleo Basin and um, we thought it would be useful also to look at a, a sessile benthic group um, for the kinds of questions we were asking. Um, so Bjorn compiled um, or integrated data from the uh, database of the Geoscience Collections of Estonia and also from the Paleobiology database of um, brachiopod occurrences uh, across the Eastern Baltic Paleo Basin. And these um, these maps are a combination of facies maps um, showing the, the um, boundaries between shallow marine carbonate facies and um, deeper marine uh, siliciclastic facies. Uh, and the little black dots are um, the sites where we've got uh, brachiopod occurrences in all of these facies types. Um, one thing that I'd, uh, I'd just like to, to point out here as well is that we, we decided to extend our analysis into the Silurian just to see uh, what the regional response was to, to the late Ordovician mass extinction and um, to the Silurian recovery. So to go on to the diversity partitioning, um, the first thing we found is that um, differences in brachiopod assemblages between formations is, is a big um, component of diversity, especially during that, um, that Ordovician diversity peak. Um, so what this, this graph shows, the orange beta symbol, is um, the mean um, additional uh, richness you get when you group together uh, formations within uh, either silice clastic or carbonate um, rock type categories. And that beta diversity value is, is larger than the, the blue beta symbol, um, which is the uh, difference between carbonate and silice clastic. Um, so in a sense that was quite surprising. What we really thought would be good to do would be to, to look um, at carbonate and siliciclastic lithologies um, individually and see if uh, see where that um, that pattern was coming from. And what we found was that um, as we'd expected the carbonates uh, really had uh, a more beta diversity. And just to explain here, the reason there are um, three sets of cur uh, curves for each of carbonates and siliciclastics is that we also brought some other uh, diversity indices to bear here which I'm not going to talk about in too much detail. Um, but we've used the Shannon index and also the Simpson index as well as the richness. And the reason we've done that um, is because the uh, diversity curve you get from, from looking at richness is quite heavily influenced by the rarest, um, the rarest genera in an assemblage. And if you look at the Shannon and the Simpson index, you get an increasing um, contribution from the commonest, uh, the commonest genera in the assemblage. So by the time you get to the Simpson index, you are... Um, really emphasizing the commonest genera. And what you can see here is that when we use the genus richness, the carbonates and siliciclastics have comparable levels of beta diversity. Um, but when you emphasize the commonest uh, genera more and more, um, so when you look at the curves at the, the bottom of the picture, um, the carbonates maintain that high beta diversity when you look at the commonest uh, brachiopods, whereas the, siliciclastic, um, the siliciclastic formations don't. And what that means is that that beta diversity you're getting in the carbonates is probably more ecologically significant um, than what you have in the siliciclastics. And this might be depth related. Um, so uh, we know that the, the carbonate lithologies tend to be in the, the shallowest environments on the platform um, and in, in the basinal uh, localities you tend to get the, the siliciclastic um, lithologies. And so there's definitely a depth, uh, depth component um, to this pattern. So until this point, uh, our results have been looking fairly hopeful, um, but then we had a go at um, evaluating the role of temporal turnover on our diversity curve. We used the same kind of hierarchical partitioning scheme, but this time uh, we grouped our sampling units, our formations together by stage, and then we looked at beta diversity between stages. Um, and what we can see here is that uh, within stages, the difference between uh, the difference in brachiopod assemblage between lithologies is fairly small compared with the um, turnover between stages and this is particularly the case during our diversity peak in time bin 06. And we think this is probably because of these uh, rapid sea level fluctuations that happened around about this time. Um, so while we're, we're pleased that we can quantify this effect using our um, hierarchical uh, diversity partitioning approach, uh, it's unfortunate that we can't actually uh, distinguish how much of that regional diversity is because of any kind of ecosystem engineering and, and how much is this temporal turnover. So where does that leave us? Um, I think where it leaves us is with a picture that the development of this uh, carbonate shelf in Baltica um, helped to increase regional richness uh, and that high beast diversity was a big contributor to this. Um, I think it also leaves us with the idea that um, high beast diversity was especially important in shallow marine environments and in uh, carbonate lithologies which is consistent with a role for, for ecosystem engineering, I guess. 
Um, but this richness curve we've produced is also heavily influenced by uh, temporal turnover and by abiotic environmental change. And taking, um, taking those two variables out of the equation is going to be really important for any study that tries to look at the broad scale impact of, of substrate changes on uh, long term diversity trends. So for the second part of this talk, I'm going to zoom into a much smaller scale uh, heterogeneity. And this is a, a study that we did on uh, reefs and reef composition. Um, and in the modern oceans, uh, the composition of reefs is quite important in influencing the diversity and the, the composition of uh, reef dwelling communities. In other words, the identity of your reef builders is quite important in determining uh, which organisms dwell in your reefs as well. So the photograph here is of a uh, modern tropical uh, patch reef uh, area uh, and in patch reefs quite often you get these complex dynamics where uh, differences in reef builder assemblages can, can uh, build up between patch reefs um, and these can contribute to habitat heterogeneity and to local um, species richness and one reason for this is uh, because different reef builders have dif make different contributions to structural complexity kind of like the rugosity map um, that I showed at the beginning. And as I also said at the beginning, uh, the Ordovician is a time of uh, major change in reef building communities. Um, so you get this shift from microbial and lithistid sponge dominated reefs to reefs dominated by um, much more abundant and diverse uh, metazoan reef builders. And I was interested in the question of how um, this increase in diversity and in the volumetric contribution of, of skeletal metazoans might have um, influenced shallow marine seascapes and in particular how it might have enhanced uh, heterogeneity in these shallow, uh, shallow marine uh, reef bearing environments. So we needed a really good uh, field locality uh, to study this question. Um, and very luckily, uh, we were able to do field work in the Mingans uh, with André de Rocher. And one of the reasons why the Mingan archipelago is such a great place um, to look at uh, Ordovician seascape evolution, if you like, is that it's got these fantastic coastal exposures uh, with 3D uh, preserva uh, excellent preservation and 3D exposure of um, these Darawillian patch reefs. And there are numerous reef localities uh, on, on different islands through the Mingan archipelago. Um, their major reef builders are a combination of lithistid sponges, um, various kinds of encrusting bryozoans, uh, and also tabulate corals. And André, in his uh, PhD thesis, uh, documented that these reefs often have very different um, compositions from one reef to another. So what we thought we would do was go in a little bit more detail and look at some spatial aspects of that, um, that difference in composition and see whether these um, these diverse reef building metazoans are actually helping to generate any kind of uh, small scale habitat heterogeneity. The other good thing about the Mingans is that it's got uh, this very useful intramingan paleocast surface. And again, Andre's done a, a great deal of work on this. Um, but it's a really fantastic marker bed. Um, and what it means is that for many of the localities where we, we went to study the reefs, we can, uh, we can be fairly sure that they're roughly contemporaneous um, based on their, their position just above this paleocast surface. So we measured the composition of a lot of um, reefs across the, across the Mingan archipelago. And we did this with a piece of string in the field and we just did some very rough point counting. So um, when we measured the composition, we don't have very high taxonomic resolution. We mostly just used um, form categories for looking at uh, the different kinds of reef builders. Um, and because this kind of uh, data collection approach is also fairly labor intensive, we couldn't uh, sample all of the reefs um, that we encountered. So we just took what we thought was a representative subset. Um, and we fed all our reef compositions or our point counts into a complete linkage cluster analysis just to see what kind of cluster topography would come out. Um, and this being complete linkage, you don't want to pay too much attention to the to the Bray Curtis dissimilarity. Um, the absolute values aren't aren't necessarily of interest. But the reefs uh, across the Mingans that we looked at uh, split roughly into uh, two main clusters, and one of them subdivided into two subclusters as well. So we went in a bit more detail to see where some of that variation is coming from. Um, and at a couple of localities, uh, we had these spectacular coastal exposures where we could really map out uh, reef compositions and, uh, and their spatial relationships to each other. Um, so one of these localities is Ile de Fontaine. And again, we had, uh, we had some point counts of, of reefs in the field. Uh, we did another cluster analysis just to, to give us some way of categorizing the, the compositions we got out. And you can see there's a fair bit of variation here. Um, and what we did, what we decided to do, was to see what was defining the difference uh, in composition between these two groups. 
Um, and what we found, so we did this uh, Wilcox and rank sum test, and what we found was between those two uh, subclusters, one and two, the major difference in composition is really that um, differences in the, the dominant reef builder. So whether you've got dominant lithistid sponges or encrusting bryozoans. Uh, and what you can also take away from this, um, from this composition diagram is that uh, most, so most of the colours on the map, I should have said, are, are subjective ideas about what the, max, uh, what the dominant reef builder was in each of the reefs on this shoreline. And what you can see is that, that that's a fairly poor predictor of, of which compositional cluster the reefs will fall into. Um, but we think at Ile de Fontaine, what's really defining um, compositional heterogeneity between these reefs is the identity of the, the main reef builder. So an increase in your number of possible reef builders should increase uh, the heterogeneity in your uh, shallow marine environments. It's a slightly different situation at um, this other island, Ile de la Fosse Pass, uh, where we did basically the same thing and ended up with reefs divided into two um, compositional clusters. And these clusters differ only in their uh, proportion of wacky stone matrix. Uh, so what we've got here is one cluster of uh, matrix poor reefs and one cluster of relatively matrix rich reefs. Uh, and what that means is that variation in the abundance of these reef builders is also an important source of um, uh, compositional heterogeneity from one reef to another. And the last thing, um, the last point I wanted to make about reef development in the Mingans is that uh, because of the presence of that intramingan unconformity, we could really see how the reefs are amplifying um, seafloor relief. So that intramingan unconformity has its own paleotopography. And um, what happens when those reefs nucleate on the unconformity is that they form these reef bands and they amplify that seafloor relief. So at larger scale, the reef builders are also contributing to, um, to complexity or, or environmental heterogeneity on the seafloor. So where does that leave us? Um, I think where it leaves us is with some evidence that increases in the abundance and the diversity of metazoan reef builders um, could work together to enhance heterogeneity in shallow marine seascapes. But as I'm sure you'll have realised, there's a ton of questions that, that remain unanswered based on this work. Um, so one thing we don't know is whether these differences in reef composition are in any way ecologically significant. Um, so are they having an effect on the kinds of reef dwelling organisms those reef might, reefs might host um, or not really? Um, and the other thing, of course, is we don't know what kinds of uh, ecological dynamics might have generated those compositional differences, and perhaps that's a, an interesting thing to look into in the future. The other thing, um, because clearly what we have here is a snapshot of a single point in time during the Darawillian, is we think it'd be interesting to know how this kind of habitat heterogeneity um, changed through time. So maybe to look at some patch reef environments um, at different time intervals and see whether uh, there actually are any trends. I'd like to end my talk just by putting the two uh, studies that I've, that I've presented here into a broader context um, and also by addressing some of the, the remaining uh, questions about how ecosystem engineering acts as a feedback on evolution. Um, so as you'll have noticed, my talk has left a lot of important questions unanswered, including uh, how ecosystem engineering changed through time, uh, to what extent it was a biodiversity driver, um, and also how ecosystem engineers might influence the evolution of other organisms. And I think these are important questions to address, uh, in part because positive ecological interactions like ecosystem engineering have had uh, relatively little attention uh, in, in studies of the impact of, of ecological interactions on long-term evolution. Uh, I think there's been a tendency to focus more on competition or predation um, because perhaps they're a bit more measurable. Um, but I think there are ways forward um, ways we might make progress in answering some of these questions. Um, for looking at ecosystem engineering through time, I think, uh, well, two things really. Firstly, I think it's important that we collect more data um, where we have uh, both abundance and diversity of uh, as many organisms in a community as possible. Um, because ecosystem engineering is all about um, interactions between species, uh, we really need more uh, comprehensive kind of censuses of, of ancient um, ecosystems and ancient communities and we also need to know uh, the relative abundances of, of the different um, different groups in those communities. I also think it would be helpful to broaden uh, our working definition of what ecosystem engineering is. I mean there's been a lot of fantastic work uh, in the Paleozoic on, on bioturbation particularly um, but the ecological literature shows us that there are all kinds of different eco uh, ecosystem engineering effects uh, happening in marine environments. 
Um, and I think it would be helpful to, to pay more attention to uh, carbonate environments and to, to other forms of ecosystem engineering that we maybe don't, um, don't investigate as closely. Um, to look at ecosystem engineering as a biodiversity driver, here I think the key problem is uh, working out what's the impact of ecosystem engineering and what is the impact of abiotic environmental conditions. And here I think where it's possible to do this, uh, using paired sites might be useful, uh, where we think that the environmental conditions are broadly the same. Um, and I think an important part of this will also be integrating uh, geochemical data so that we can uh, be sure that if we do get differences between sites uh, with what we think are different levels of ecosystem engineering, it's actually the ecosystem engineering that's, that's driving that, that diversity difference. Um, and lastly, this, uh, this question of how ecosystem engineers might influence the evolution of other organisms, which is really expressed in this, in this diagram I used at the beginning of the talk. Um, I think often in, in paleontology or, or as geologists, we're quite good at uh, coming up with ways to measure the impact that our species one has on the environment. But what's really far more difficult is to look at those spillover effects on species two. Um, and I think it's possible that, that there are some ways forward here also uh, in that we could look more closely at the function of ancient ecosystems um, and the possible resource flows through those ecosystems uh, as a way of generating hypotheses about what specific kinds of ecosystem engineering, uh, what impacts we might expect uh, particular kinds of ecosystem engineering to have over time. And I think it would be great uh, to do this, uh, largely so that we could come up with this more comprehensive idea of the role of ecological interactions in, in shaping life on the planet. Um, so I'll finish by just uh, thanking the many people who've made, uh, made this work possible, uh, and also by thanking you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice talk or a nice video. Is Amalia here? So maybe she respond to uh, one or two questions. Um, Can I have some questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, very interesting talk. And uh, I just uh, I have a small question about uh, the uh, uh, and Wilcoxon text. You you just show you try to uh, use Wilcoxon Wilcoxon test to to test if uh, uh, some of the, the the factors are the driver of uh, of the difference between those two group, but. Um, I just wondering why I why, why you pick a wax stone as one of the factor rather than other uh, lithology uh, index. Um, so I, I should have mentioned that that was the uh, the main kind of matrix that those reefs had. So we, when we were looking at them, they're quite um, matrix dominated. So when we did the point counts, we included the the wacky stone as kind of a, a blanket term for this um, uh, yeah for the for the matrix as opposed to the kind of larger skeletal. Um, grains or bigger reef builders that we were able to uh, identify. So does that answer your question? And another question is about uh, how, how, how do you um, uh, do the point counting in the field or uh, under the micro, micro facies? Uh, we did that in the field. So um, we had, um, I, know, I know Bjorn's done this kind of thing before, um, but we had basically just pieces of uh, uh, like knotted string with knots at five centimeter intervals and just laid them over the reefs and um, recorded what was there at each of the knots. So it's not, a, um, it's not based on uh, you know, thin section analysis, it's really just field-based point counts that we use. Okay, I'm afraid I'm we afraid have to move have on. To move on. <laughs> And uh, so, so for everybody so for who's me. wondering that we're 10 minutes behind of schedule, this is because of the break, but we won't cut off time from your talks. So we're 10 minutes behind schedule. Anyway, the next talk is um, by Farid Saleh, and he's talking about untangling the ecology and fossil preservation, not for paleozoic biotas. And that's apparently also pre-recorded. Christian? Hello everyone, I'm very happy today to be remotely with you to speak about, about our latest work with colleagues from Yunnan University in China, the University of Lyon in France, the University of Exeter in the UK, and the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. 
My talk today will aim to decipher how preservation biases that are operational in the fossil record impact our understanding of ancient ecosystems on Earth. I would like to start my presentation by emphasizing on the importance of the fossil record. Without fossils, we wouldn't know that dinosaurs existed. Most importantly, we wouldn't know about the link that these beasts have with modern birds. The fossil record is also essential to understand biodiversifications and extinctions events. In this figure, we have the geological time scale on the X axis and marine animal diversity on the Y axis. And we can Oops, it's it's it just froze. Uh, sorry, something went wrong here, I think. I think the video is 11 minutes, so we have four minutes for fixing. Can be solidly formed from cells can play an important role in certain environments, such as jellyfishes in the photograph to the right. The importance of soft-bodied animals is not only evidenced in modern ecosystems, it is as well evidenced in environments dating back to the Cambrian 500 million years ago. On the left side, we have the Cambrian diversity when including only mineralized parts that are easily preserved. On the, le on the right side, we have the same environment while including data from soft animals. And we can clearly tell that Cambrian biodiversity would be strongly biased if we only include mineralized animals. In this study, we wanted to push the limits a bit further. Thus, we questioned ourselves. What was the accuracy of this type of preservation or soft tissue preservation? Meaning that even if we, were, if we preserve the most labile soft parts, does it really mean that we preserve everything? And because we are dealing with the fossil record, the only way to answer this question is by comparing different exceptionally preserved biotas. For this reason, we chose three iconic sites with exceptional fossil preservation. First, we have the Fezwata Shale from the Ordovician of Morocco that yielded these giant, beautiful, nectonic arthropods. Then we have the Burgess Shale from the Cambrian of Canada with this Opabinia. And last but not least, we have the Chengyang biota from the Cambrian of China with this amazing arthropod preserving a vascular system. And I think this is one of the only specimens ever discovered to preserve a vascular system in such details. And the first question that we wanted to answer is what is actually preserved in these sites? In order to answer this question, we divided biological structures into five categories. A, B, C, D, and E. The first category is for biomineralized minerals, such as shells of brachiopods, as we can see in figure C in here. The category B is for sclerotized structures, such as the head shield of some arthropods, as shown in figure B. The category C is for cuticularized structures formed of polysaccharides, such as the body walls of arthropods and priapolids. The category D is for cellular structures in direct contact with seawater, such as the body of cambroernids and jellyfishes. And finally, we have category E, that is for internal organs, such as the digestive and the nervous systems. Following uh, this step, we built a database that includes the presence absence of each category for each taxon in the three sites, the Fizwata Shale, the Burgess Shale, and the Chengyang Biota. And I should mention this database includes 500 taxa in total. Then taxa were divided into four different groups. If a taxon preserves one type of biological structures, it belongs to group one, such as the heolith to the left that preserves only biomineralized parts. 
If a taxon preserves two type of structures, it belongs to group two, such as the helix in the middle, preserving both biominerals and internal organs. Group three includes taxa preserving three types of structures, such as the heolith to the right, having biomineral, uh, biominerals, internal organs, and soft cellular structures in direct contact with seawater. When we plot the proportions of the different groups for the Fizwata shale, the Burgess shale, and the Chenyang biota, we notice that the preservation pattern in the Ordovician Lagerstadt is strikingly different from the one for Cambrian Lagerstätten. The Fizwata shale preserved on average one type of structure per taxon. On the opposite side, the Burgess shale and the Chengyang biota preserved two to three structures per taxon on average. Most importantly, the Fizwata shale did not preserve neither soft cellular structures, such as the tentacles of helid, nor completely cellular organisms, such as early chordates. These results are not simply obs observations, they are backed up by data from statistical modeling pointing to a significant difference between the Fizwata shale on one hand and the Burgess shale and the Chengyang biota on the other hand. These results indicate that original biodiversity is most likely underestimated in the Fizwata shale. If we go further into details, we notice that differences between sites are as well observed between Cambrian biotas. For instance, the Burgess shale has the highest proportion of entirely cellular organisms belonging to the DE category. When we published these results back in February 2020, we suggested that the Burgess shale is the acme for soft tissue preservation. However, does this really mean that the Burgess shale best represents Paleozoic ecosystems? To answer this question, we had to expand our investigations even further. We divided animal taxa between three categories. The first category is endobentic taxa with animals living, uh, living in the sediments, such as priapolids and some brachiopods. The next category includes both epibentic and nectobentic taxa living on or near the seafloor, such as trilobites and echinoderms. The third category combines both planktonic and nectonic taxa that live high in the water column, such as some arthropods and ectinophores. When we combine the recently obtained data with data on structure preservation, we notice that for all tissue associations, the Fizwata biota and dark gray preserves best the nectonic planktonic community when compared to the Walcott quarry in the Burgess shale. On the contrary, the Walcott quarry that is represented in light gray better preserve the endobentis. Probabilistic modeling highlights that these differences are significantly different. The results of the Burgess shale cannot be randomly generated from a biota having a similar composition to the Fizwata shale. If I want to summarize a bit what we have obtained until now, we can say with confidence that the Fizwata shale underrepresents entirely cellular taxa in addition to the endobentic community, while the Burgess shale, particularly the Walcott quarry, underestimates the nectonic planktonic community. You might not be convinced by our results, but these will make way more sense when we put them into their taphonomic context. In the Walcott quarry from the Burgess shale, animals are transported alive or shortly after their death by obrusion events from their living environment to their facies in which they got preserved. In this scenario, we can expect that some taxa are too heavy to transport and other free swimmers can escape the flow. Most importantly, nectonic taxa living high in the water column are not affected by event deposition that will transport mainly epibentic and endobentic communities due to its erosive base. This process can explain the rarity of complete specimens belonging to taxa such as Anomalocaris and the abundance of Anomalocaris smolting products. This is because molting products fall on the seafloor and are passively transported by obrusion events. Regarding the Fizwata shale, many animals died and were decaying on the seafloor prior to their in situ burial by storm deposits. This pre burial decay explains the absence of completely cellular organisms such as Cambra ernids from the Fizwata shale. 
because cellular organs are the most fragile structures and they decay first. And the lack of transport in the Fizwata shale, when compared to the Walcott Quarry, explains why we were able to preserve giant carcasses of radiodonts that felt on the seafloor. Furthermore, in some cases in the Fizwata shale, we evidenced that some endobentic taxa, such as brachiopods, were not affected by some centimeters of sediments added on top. These brachiopods adjusted their posi position within the sediment and continued to grow. This can explain why the endobentic community is underrepresented in the Fizwata biota. It is worth mentioning here that the, both the Walcott Quarry and the Fizwata biota failed to preserve taxa such as ctenophores and medusoids, but for totally different reasons. In the Fizwata shale, these animals decayed fast prior to the arrival of storm deposits. In the Walcott Quarry, these animals were not captured by obrusion events. And this is why we only have polypoid forms in the Walcott Quarry and never medusoids. These results also highlight that we should give more and more consideration for the subtle taphonomic differences between sites. All three sites that we included here are considered as Burgess Shale type deposits. However, this, that, this, this does not necessarily mean that they were preserved exactly the same way. Furthermore, for ecological comparisons and analysis, we should account for preservational biases that are operational at these sites. This study only scratches the surface. Further work is required to understand how these biases can be corrected and combined with more traditional studies in order to properly frame early evolutionary events such as the Cambrian explosion and the Ordovician radiation. It is only then that we can confirm whether these two events constitute a single episode of anatomical innovation. And thank you a lot for your attention. Okay, great, thanks. So I think we have a lot of time for questions. Um, are there any? I can just add, we should ask questions because uh, Farisi just uh, escaped a major fire in the port of Beirut, but he made it outside and now he's here. <laughs> So that's very good. So I hope we have some questions somewhere. Well. Is it you, Richard, playing music? If my son is practicing cello in the back, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it's, uh, yeah. I was, I was just trying to locate who to mute, but I couldn't see other than I, you. I can try. Oh, yeah. I'm very sorry. Uh, it's just, you picked the wrong time for me as a moderator. <laughs> okay, we've got, got a question. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid the one thing that struck me is this difference with the um, between the Ordovician, uh, Fezwata, planktic and nectic assemblages uh, compared with the Cambrian ones. But of course, is this partly explained simply by there being many more planktic and nectic groups there, like the graptolites and their nautiloids and so on, that just didn't really exist in the Cambrian? Or is it other groups that we're not thinking of? Yeah. Uh, hi, I don't know if you can hear me because my internet in Lebanon now is is very slow that's good uh, but uh, no actually it cannot uh, result from the fact that we have more plankton or nectar in the fizzwater it is because we didn't compare the, the, the proportion of uh, nectonic planktonic uh, taxa directly between both what we compared is the proportion of exceptionally preserved animals belonging to the nectonic planktonic community which means we compared the number of planktonic nectonic uh, animals in the fizzwater preserving soft tissues to the proportion of nectonic planktonic animals in the Burgess Shale, preserving, uh, preserving soft tissues over the total number in the Burgess Shale. So we didn't compare uh, simply the proportions of nectonic planktonic taxa. At the, uh, here, the study is just for exceptional preservation. Okay, that helps, thanks.
Um, I have a question. So in the Devonian, you find uh, some faunas which have very nice preservation, like the Bundenbach shale or so. Um, would you expect that there's uh, in other t or till when in the Paleozoic do you think this is a fraction of the of the fossil record would is hidden behind this preservation window? Well, I think when it comes to exceptional preservation, all exceptionally preserved biotas are biased. Uh, I don't know exactly what is preserved in the Devonian, so I can, cannot tell right now. But uh, I think uh, if we really want to understand uh, and end the debate between, or like the different differences in opinions between many talks uh, during uh, this meeting, uh, we should focus more and more on preservation because most studies consider that preservation and preservation biases are homogeneous across like uh, time and space, which is uh, totally not true. And here we're showing that ex even exceptionally preserved biotas uh, are biased to dif uh, in different ways. So uh, we definitely need to do more and more about preservation and include that with uh, statistics in the future to understand how and why these biases are operational in the geological record in general from the Cambrian till modern time. So any, any other comments, questions, or general remarks? Otherwise, Christian, should we wait or move on? I think we should uh, move on, as we are behind anyway. So, uh, yeah. so then uh, next talk uh, is by Björn Kröger. Um, and it's on early middle Ordovician seascape scale aggregation pattern of sponge reefs across the Laurentian paleo continent. Have fun, everybody. So let's share the screen and play the video. Any, anything to see? Hello, hello. Seems fine. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> so, rather long title. Early to Middle Ordovician seascape scale aggregation pattern of sponge ridge reefs across Laurentia Paleo continent. Um, yeah, this is basically some preliminary results that we present, Björn and uh, me and Amelia Penny, from our fieldwork during the last three years in the framework of a project funded by the Academy of Finland on ecosystem engineering in deep time. And Amelia gave a wonderful, already a wonderful. Um, review on what we did the, during the last years and there are of course lots of other aspects and one of the aspects is uh, something we have to talk about when we talk about the Gobi and this is the reef evolution during the Cumbro Audition time interval. This I think is a crucial time interval for the, the Cumbro Audition is a crucial time interval for the evolution of the reefs at global scale and what happened during this time was nicely illustrated by this uh, diagram by Natsuko Adashi in a paper from 2011. It's a little bit complicated, but it shows basically when you look at those, it has color codes. And the color codes in blue shows the microbe dominated reefs. And then it has some diagrammatic pictures of something like a diversity here, a timeline here. And what it shows is the green colors are sponge and sponge-like reef builders and the red and the purple colors shows more complex uh, skeletal metazoans like palmatozoan, bryozoan, stromatoporites and corals. And this diagram tells us that there was something going in in the Ordovician and what was going on is the diversification of uh, skeletal metazoan reefs dominated by palmatozoans, bryozoans, stomato stomatoporoans, and so on. So this is something we know. And another way to, to simply show what was going on during this time under, in the interval is this diagram, um, which focuses on the skeleton, the, the morphotypes or the types of skeletons. So it's a different time scale. It starts here in the Adiaca and ends in the Ordovician. And it shows us that we have changing reef builder skeletons during time. 
And that also means we have changing reef architectures at the level of individual reefs. So the taxonomy, the different groups of organisms, and the different skeletons they build. This is something which is at the moment at least relatively well known and there are lots of reviews and papers on this. But when we go in the field, and Amelia showed already a beautiful pictures of that area, uh, we see already there's another aspect of this reef evolution. And this is visible in that picture. Reefs formed and were formed on ancient seascapes. Yeah, here individual reefs, reef patches form several hundred meter wide belts in a beautifully outcropped, weathered outcropped in that area in the Mingan Islands. And um, this is an aerial view showing a cluster of modern pet reefs in the Great Barrier Reef. And when we look at this picture, of course, some questions arise. And the question would be different Ordovician reefs and patch size and patch spacing, patch distribution. And more generally, are there something like trends in patch size and spacing at landscape, seascape scale? Are there trends in patch pattern? And <clears throat> Luckily, there is a possibility to formalize this question a little bit, to compare patch distributions. One way to do this is to distinguish between regular patches and irregular patches and between aggregated or clustered patches, randomly, completely randomly distributed patches, and then you, ha you have regularly dispersed patches or randomly dispersed patches. So this is just to get you an idea that it is possible to, to think about the landscape distribution of patch reefs. But we also can take a closer look to the seascape uh, scale vertical succession of, of reefs, of reef successions. And this is just because I don't have a, I didn't find a better picture, um, a picture of an outcrop of a coral stromatoporite reef from, from Newfoundland, Long Point Formation, Upper Ordovician, but it shows that there can be patches, dispersed patches of individual colonies, but you can scale this up and it could look at the same scale. You could see this in a, in a, in a succession of, of different reefs that it would be different reefs, which would be more dispersed. And another exp example would be, is for instance, the Flowers Cove uh, place also in Newfoundland and within the Germadocian St. George group. There, the reefs are well constrained in individual horizons and they, the reefs themselves look completely different. They are these pancake shaped plots, which are uh, blobs, which are sometimes coalescent and form sheets. So again, we have a question, sea scale, scape, vertical suc successions. Are there trends in patch shape? over the Ordovician or Cumbria or Cumbria Ordovician and, uh, and other trends in vertical patch distribution. Again, we can formalize this a little bit and I tried to do this in a very rough way. Uh, if you look at the succession of, uh, of a sedimentological succession and then the, this would be something like a bed, this would be another bed or a so sequence of beds, yeah, so you get an impression. Reefs could, reef patches could occur in complete random. They could be, could occur in, in that, at, ever, at each scale, it could occur as episodal occurrences or in well constrained horizons, or they could occur in clustered occurrences. So this is just an idea to look at these reef occurrences and with these questions in mind, uh, during the last three years, we visited several Ordovician reef sites, um, mainly across North America. And what we visited specifically were places in Western Newfoundland, in the Mingan Islands, and in the Ibex area, all classic, classic, classic exposures, well exposures of carbonate platforms, and uh, in the Ibex area, we visited, we heard already a talk, the talk of Richard about this in the morning. Um, so we visited places or occurrences within the Fillmore Formation. Um, 
the reef horizons, they have individual names that, such as church, the church reefs, the Miller reefs, and other reefs in the Vava limestone. Then uh, in, the, in Western Newfoundland, we visited reef occurrences in, in the lower Trimadocian Watts Bight formation, and in the middle Ordovician Table Point formation. And in the Mingan Islands, we also already saw a talk about this. Uh, we visited the late Darivillian uh, reef occurrences in the Grand, 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 Grand Point member um, of the Mingan formation. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to show beautiful, the beautiful reef exposures in all these places. The only thing I can show at this today here is something like plots of GPS coordinates, like uh, pot, plot, point plots. So you can see this as a map without any other information than the occurrence of the GPS points of each individual reef. And there are sometimes, there are very different, different exposures. So this is a scale of 100 meter. This was here somewhere in a hillscape. And along that hillscape, a narrow bed ex was expo is exposed, uh, the church where the church reefs occur. And we just measured each GPS point of each reef. And we did this in several places. And as you can see here in the Mingan Islands, these exposures were much more spacious uh, along or on roughly narrow bands on, on uh, along yeah, outcrops or bedding surfaces. So everything in between. And with this, it is possible to, to, to measure distances, nearest distances, uh, point pattern between the reefs. And what we used is one measure, which is very useful, that is the Clark Evans aggregation index. It is a measure of the degree of dispersal and clustering of the different patches. And um, it is a ratio of the observed mean nearest neighbor distance of patches and the mean distance under a random distribution. So when there is a random distribution of the observed patches, oh, let's see if I see my mouse, we have some uh, Clark Evans uh, index of one. If they, if they are more dispersed, the, the index is larger than one. And if the index is smaller than one, they are more aggregated and more clustered. And uh, this, I plotted this, or we plotted this here again, the, our results of the, of the point pattern against time. And it looks here that we have something like a trend. Yeah? But I have to say, we have to look at this with caution. So there might be a trend over the order vision toward more dispersed uh, patterns. But uh, of course, our, our data are really limited. We have only these few data and it is really important to, to collect more and to get a better overview. But just to show this in, in, in a different way to have a, get a better impression what really happened, or what really is visible, at least in the places we visited, is that in the lowermost Trimadocian what spite formation, we uh, usually saw this coalescent patches of reefs, highly clustered patches of reefs. And then in the Florian, uh, the reefs are clustered, but these coalescent patches of, of thrombolites and so on, they are not so common anymore. And then middle order vision, Darivillian Mingan formation, we see really high, dis highly dispersed uh, uh, patches. And in the sa same way we do this, we can also compare the vertical reef distributions in the sedimentary successions. And again, we can start with the oldest uh, occurrences of the white Watts bite formation. And the lower Ordovician carbonates of no New Fundland, the reefs are distributed on top of local truncation surfaces at the top of shallow up cycles. And they are more or less randomly distributed in the succession across a very wide area, tens of kilometers or even several tens of kilometers on a carbonate platform. And they are always associated with erosional surfaces. And we call this the mosaic growth, uh, reef, mode of reef growth. And then we have these occurrences in the Fillmore Formation, which are really episodically um, the reefs there are distributed really well constrained and a meter, in meter thick 
horizons associated with sequence boundaries and widespread erosional surfaces. And these horizons, again, may span several tens of kilometers in successions that might be tens of or even hundreds of meters thick. And then um, when we look at the Darwillian Mingan formation, we see a different pattern. And this is uh, there, the reefs are concentrated in banks and belts. And uh, Amelia already showed a picture of, of, of our reconstructions of these banks and belts and the Mingan formation. And they are less well associated with truncation horizons. So that I show this here in this picture that there are sometimes no erosional surfaces below the reefs. Um, and we call this then the band, belt and bank mode. And it, again, at this time, uh, with what we saw, at least in Laurentia, it seems there is a trend from this mosaic mode toward a belt and bank mode within the Ordovician. And this mosaic mode is really something that exists and that I have or we have seen only in the lower Ordovician in the upper Cumbrian. And uh, So there might be some story in that, but of course, this is just the beginning of what we do. And uh, I would encourage and uh, people who who work on reefs to look at these landscape scale pictures and to see if they maybe see uh, patterns like that. And maybe this is an aspect of the Ordovician, of the Gobi, of the diversification of reefs, that there is really a different landscape and that landscape might be influenced by whatever changes in, in the biota or in the physical chemical um, uh, ocean states. So at this point I can summa summarize. Quantitative methods to measure reef pattern are available. There are differences in the seascape scale depositional pattern of sponge rich reefs and possible tra trends exist throughout the Cumbro Ordovician, but this is still something we have to, to look at. And this is the thank. We thank Andre de Rocher, Richard Hoffman, Seth Finnegan, Forrest Garn, Noel James, Paul Jameson, Rachel Wood, Sven Stoja, Mikkel Mechenik, and others. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Björn, for this nice talk. Are there any questions? <coughs> Here again. <laughs> Go. Okay. Go ahead. Um, one thing that uh, might be really interesting to look into is in uh, modern demosponges, they're extremely patchy on a small scale. And th th there's still very little understanding of what exactly controls it. If you look in one reef area, you'll find a species concentrated in one area, and then 10 meters away, you'll find another patch. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering whether this is well, a, a change in uh, the actual dominance in the earliest times and they presumably became less um, dominant as part of the reef structure going up towards the Darawillian. If there is, that might partly explain it. It might be worth looking at different species as well. Yeah, yeah. And that is also what, what Amelia before mentioned, that these patches, they are heterogeneous and they, and this heterogeneity yeah, is definitely... Is definitely Oh, now I hear oh, myself. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely, definitely in, uh, dimension yeah. of biodiversity bio, bio, of the biodiversification that we have. Like one reef is dominated by that group, the next one, and they build it just a. And this is really a fascinating aspect. So at at, at low scale level, and uh, the other thing I wanted to say is also that probably bio bio erosion or bio biodiversity uh, bio what is it. What, Ursula talked about this. Bioturbation. Bio 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 had an aspect, was an aspect of this change in sea scale pattern of, of deposition of reefs, of patches. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Stephen Kershaw has a question. I better read it out loud. Um, I wonder if the reason for individual reef growth is due to suitable conditions, e.g., substrate and sedimentation rate, and this may be down to what is happening layer by layer and area by area. So the reefs reflect sedimentation rate and substrate conditions rather than a particular biological pattern. Yeah, there is this wonderful paper by Coven, probably you know this, by Coven, and do I have a citation here? Hopefully I have it. 
no, I forgot it in my talk. Coven and James, I think they worked on the on the late Cambrian, early Ordovician uh, carbonate platform in Newfoundland, and they showed at least what they show for 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 for, for this area that there is indeed it's just a large carbonate platform and, and, and probably in, the, in, in, in the large parts of, of, of the Chemadocian carbonate platform in North America, the large, car, the great carbonate bank. That this is really like a more or less biologically controlled, but more or less really randomly that you have these shoals and then erosion. And because of this erosion, uh, which is really like on a local shoal, you have a after in the next transgression in these microcycles or, or paracycles, a reef just at that place, and then uh, the, the 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 evolution the, the time changes, and you have a, the, exactly the same thing in a, just a different place, and this is then just creates some ran, random or mosaic pattern of reefs, but uh, that this was then not possible, it could be in hypothesis, it's this strange pattern could then not be possible after maybe extreme disturbance by bioturbation or whatever. I don't know what is the reason why we have these different pattern. Also, um, of course, this episodal pattern of reefs, is this is something which occurs locally in one place and then you have the mosaic reef growth in another place, in more distal places in the platform, on the platform and so on. But uh, there might be a general picture in this. I don't know. It's just uh, at the moment, I think. Uh, okay. Last, last question. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Uh, so Bjorn, uh, Bjorn, thanks for the nice talk. And I was quite interested in the, the, these geographic distributions of the reefs. And in my experience that if you look at the Cambrian reefs, then they were really more bedded. You have the reefs at certain horizons and they just sporadically occur according to the sequences. And when I looked at the Ordovician reefs, they were more like those in the Fillmore, the one in the Utah mm -hmm. and Nevada. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious that uh, the one in the Newfoundland was quite strange. Is we, I didn't really see anything like that outside of the Newfoundland. So the question is that, but, but uh, sorry, the thing is that when we go into the upper division, we mm -hmm. see something more like what you just have showed us. Mm -hmm. So I just, where I didn't really did the observation like what you have done, but it's just my gut, uh, just rough feeling that the Cambrian to the earlier division reefs had more bedded structures. Whereas mm -hmm. as we get into the upper division, we have more clustered more aggregated type of the reefs as you have shown mm -hmm. so i just want to hear your opinion on that i don't have any i must say this is really like uh, i gave i give this talk only just to to what is it to to give an a little bit and and um, to 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 give an idea to just to to look at this it's at this scale and maybe we will see some trends but at this moment it's just more or less a very limited view and and of course it might be that that i see trends but this is just a local thing or the selection of our field work or whatever but um, who knows maybe you see something in in uh in in, in, in south korea or in in, in the in the chinese um, uh, paleo plates uh, and we at some point can get some review about this and get a bit, bit better overview. So, but I generally think that the C scale, C scale dimension is something we should take a look at. Uh, despite of sequence and sequence, the sequence pattern, of course we have to look also in the sequence stratigraphy and so on, uh, the positional cycles and so on, but there might be something, something else. I'm afraid we have to carry on and it's my Honor and pleasure to uh, introduce the last regular speaker for today and for the meeting. Uh, it was great fun. Um, so we have Ole Hinz here waiting for um, to talk about uh, paired carbonate and organic carbon isotope records from the Ordovician of Estonia, local, regional, or global drivers. So enjoy that one, please.
So now, can you hear me? Yes. Fine? Okay. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be the last speaker, and I would like to express my my gratitude to all organizers for making this uh, this online conference very enjoyable and and very smoothly smoothly running. So still, I'm hoping to meet you all in person uh, soon. So today, I will present you. Uh, some preliminary results of our study on paired carbon isotopes from the Baltic uh, sections. Uh, this is actually part of um, our new national uh, research projects between Tallinn University of Technology, where I'm coming from, and the University of Tartu. And we are seeking to, to extend our knowledge of, of carbon isotopes um, in order to, to get a better understanding of the drivers of those isotopic variations and excursions. So I think it's appropriate to start with this figure, even though it's, uh, I guess, well known to all of you, published uh, by Stig Bergström and colleagues in 2009. This one ties the global compilation of carbon isotope excursions to our chronostratigraphic framework. And I think stratigraphy has been among the most important applications of, of carbon isotopes in, in Ordovician geology. Well, the major excursions like, like HICE are, are indeed excellent tools in, in both global and regional correlations, but carbon isotope chemostratigraphy has taken much further and um, it has been proposed, uh, for instance, in, in this example by uh, Stig Bergström, again, that even much uh, smaller, sometimes smaller than one per mil um, isotopic excursions are, are useful for regional, but also intercontinental correlations. Well, I guess some people might have a little bit different opinion about this. And uh, we'll see more than uh, one per mil fascist related uh, spatial trends uh, within the basin, of course, and and so on. But the truth is that we don't know very well the drivers be behind those, uh, those smaller isotopic excursions. So that's still a lot of work to do. Coming closer to our study area, the Baltica and the Baltoscandian Basin, uh, this has been one of the key regions that provided the data also for the global compilation. And during more than 25 years of studies, notably initiated by the works by Pat Frenchley and, and co-authors. Many tens of sections and many thousands of data points on, on carbon isotopic composition of, of carbonate rocks have been accumulated during this period. And this uh, has allowed to establish a fine regional chemostratigraphic standard that was published um, by Leho Einzar and co-authors 10 years ago, which includes uh, 17 formal isotopic zones and so we can conclude that uh, carbon isotope records from the carbonate rocks uh, from Baltica, Baltoscandia and Estonia in particular, particular are, are very well known. So it's, it's getting a little bit boring. But carbon isotopes can of course be analyzed not only from carbonate rocks, but also from an, another archive, which is the organic matter. And in many regions and geological settings, this is the only option to find carbon for, for isotopic analysis, let it be for, for stratigraphic or, or any other use. Uh, the advantage working with carbonate rocks is that uh, you can study both archives, as was done, for instance, this uh, example by Cole Edwards and Matt Saltzman a few years ago. And usually, as you know, there is uh, about 20 to 30 per mil difference between the two, which is caused by the fact that living things uh, prefer the lighter isotopes. And this difference uh, quoted as big delta 13C is an important proxy in itself. In most cases, it shows good correspondence with a carbonate curve, but, but not always. And it implicates uh, changes in biological fractionation over time or in space. So this can be used as a proxy for reconstructing some environmental um, parameters or, or conditions like has been done in this uh, work uh, by Cole Edwards and, and co-authors a few years ago. 
uh, where they um, modeled oceanic uh, and atmospheric oxygen levels based on paired carbonate and organic carbon isotopic data. So in order to more fully understand the carbon cycling and, and drivers as well as spatial scope of isotopic excursions, combined carbonate and organic matter data are, are very useful. Coming back to Baltica in recent years, many new studies on, uh, on both organic and carbonate carbon records have been published, but uh, they mostly concern the Silurian period. Um, two examples are provided here by uh, uh, Seth Young and Jocelyn Richardson and co-authors. And those works uh, interestingly point to to the importance of uh, diagenetic uh, history and, and a lot of different uh, aspects of those curves, not just the, the global uh, changes in carbon cycling. So the revision is not so well covered. There are a few works uh, from recent years uh, from Sweden studying uh, organic carbon isotopes from organic matter, but those uh, paired records are very rare. Actually, this paper by Seth Young, also 10 years ago, uh, discusses this uh, very interesting but still very restricted stratigraphic interval for the paired uh, isotopic records. So here comes the motivation of this work. We aimed at filling this gap and producing a reasonably high resolution and stratigraphically uh, extensive and reference data for the middle and upper division of the, of the Baltic region. And in this first step, we focus on sections from Estonia, but uh, some new material from Latvian and Lithuanian sections is also uh, being collected and, and analyzed. So there are a few things we, we wanted to know. First is that if we can produce real, reliable carbon isotopic record uh, for the organic matter, uh, how variable would it be? and how well it would fit with a well-established uh, carbonate reference curve. And then, um, is it valuable for stratigraphy? What is the offset between the carbonate and organic matter stable isotopes? Um, does it have any time constraint trend or any trend in, within the basin? And, and uh, finally, can we, can we distinguish between the local, regional and global? variations and can we can we learn something about the drivers of those excursions. So the Baltoscandian basin is already has been already well introduced during um, during several talks today so I, I will not go into details here but briefly our new data comes from uh, three three localities uh, three trill cores uh, called Lella, Vicky and Tartu trill cores. Uh, they all come from relatively shallow water parts of the of the Baltoscandian Basin. And I should also uh, mention that the lower Ordovician is mostly siliciclastic in this uh, Baltoscandian Basin and Baltica um, uh, in general. So, so the, the good carbonate data comes from middle and upper Ordovician only. So during, during that time, indeed the, the basin uh, developed quite a lot from a sediment starved carbonate ramp in the middle order vision uh, to more differentiated carbonate platforms starting from the Katian uh, when the sediment input increased considerably and when we get uh, first um, tropical carbonates and so, so on. Um, so in the context of isotopic records and geochemistry in, in general it's important to note that the many Baltic sections are, are very well preserved. The CAI is about one supported by many other uh, maturity indicators, uh, providing a good uh, well, support or indication that the original signatures may be quite well preserved in those um, Baltic uh, limestones. So, so far we have analyzed almost uh, 500 samples from those three trill cores. Uh, carbon isotope analyses have been made using conventional methods in, in Tallinn as well in Tartu. Uh, the rocks, the limestones are usually very low in, in TOC, uh, in organic matter, uh, remaining between, TOC remaining between uh, uh, 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 per mil, 
down location in few samples uh, reaching about 1%, so very few organic material on average. The stratigraphic framework is very well established in the region. Uh, we use regional stages, but also chitinozoan and conodont biostratigraphy provides the most useful time correlation criteria. And in some levels, we can use also k-pentonites for, for our time, time tracers. So uh, here, uh, as an example, is the Lella Trill core showing about 200 meters of uh, middle and uh, Middle Ordovician, Upper Ordovician, and a little bit of Landoveri as well, carbonate strata. In terms of lithology, it's pretty variable, coming starting from lime mudstones, grainstones, and uh, marls, so it's pretty variable. The two other sections, uh, Vicky and Tartu, those are uh, reference drill cores which are very well characterized by lithology as well as geochemistry. So, and also carbonate, um, carbon isotope records from both uh, sections are, are quite well established and, and published several years ago. So, coming to the results, uh, uh, here is an example of, um, of the Lille core again. The carbon, carbonate carbon record is pretty, pretty, yeah, looks like expected. We can identify most of the, or all of the uh, regional uh, events and excursions. If we add the, the organic um, data, uh, things look roughly similar, but one could see that uh, there's a little bit more scatter in the data. And this is something we, we wanted to compare uh, with uh, similar data sets from, from other regions. So I show this, uh, Nice drawing uh, from Edwards and Salzman, 2016, where these authors uh, analyzed the big data set and um, illustrated the variability or scatter of the data for both uh, organic and carbonate uh, carbon isotopes. So what the graph uh, shows is essentially average uh, deviation of individual data points from the moving average trend line. So Indeed, this picture is influenced by, by the sampling density and study time span, but still it gives you some idea. Uh, the first observation, of course, is that uh, organic uh, data are much more scattered, much more variable, and there is a huge difference between different uh, data sets. Uh, now, if we have the Estonian uh, data, you see that uh, they seem to position quite nicely into this picture representing some of the least uh, scattered data sets, uh, if I may say so. And this uh, well suggests that um, the original signatures might be relatively well preserved in this data set. Uh, the range of organic carbon isotopic values uh, uh, shown here, it's uh, compared to some other data sets, it seems to be pretty light, um, and there is also a basin-wide um, trend. We're able to, to distinguish between those trill cores. Seems that the, the numbers or the values, of the isotopes get a little bit heavier towards the deeper part of the basin, and this is also true for, for carbonate carbon. The uh, trend is about, or difference is about one per mil or so, maybe even a little bit more. If we look the, the offset between the carbonate and the organic curves, there is a similar spatial trend. You know, on average, the offset between carbonate and organic reservoirs is, is about one per mil within the basin, within pretty small area, actually. If we compare this to some other uh, uh, published data sets, it, uh, it looks like Estonian data shows a less a scatter and and also a large offset, relatively large offset. In order to explore the temporal and uh, spatial trends in the data, I blotted here the uh, three sections side by side so that uh, the depth of the basin increases from left to right and the sections are 
um, in different vertical, vertical scale, but they are aligned by two main features which are easily recognizable. And those are the MDICE, the Middle Darwinian excursion, and HICE. So those are taken as the uh, sort of correlation lines here. And now let's zoom in a little bit. Um, so what, what's happening here and, and what you can see, first thing is that the MDICE is very well visible in, in both curves and in also in all, all three sections. So it uh, has been shown to be a global feature. What's behind, what's the driver? There have been different opinions about this and I'm not um, providing a conclusive evidence here. The MTIS is followed by something that's called lower Sandbian negative excursion, sometimes called also Kukruza low. Again, both uh, curves and all three sections provide uh, pretty much the same story here. Um, very similar negative interval has been described from, from other parts of the world, so it might be uh, a global thing as, as well. So interestingly, it coincides with the interval of Kukersite deposition in the Baltic area, and this is reflected also um, in the TOC curve, which shows a distinct peak in this uh, interval being thus uh, negatively correlated with the isotopic curve. So uh, in other levels, the, there's no obvious correlation between the uh, carbon isotopes and the TOC. So that's something which might mean, mean something. Okay, going a little bit higher up in the succession, here things look, uh, uh, look somewhat different. Uh, the first observation is that the offset between the two curves um, seems to vary a lot and, and also there is a lot of variability between the different sections, uh, much more than in the Darwinian and Sampian. So regarding the individual excursion, excursion so we can, we can see something which is can be taken as, as, as guys. So I'm a little bit running out of time here, so I'm moving uh, forward a little bit uh, maybe quicker. We see a several uh, well-established um, uh, events and curves on those um, successions, but also the organic curves show us something which is not reflected in the, in the carbon curves. For instance, something we have in the so-called Saunia excursion, have a negative uh, organic uh, curve, which might be related, oh, one image is missing here. Okay, sorry. Um, which might be related to the well-known carcification uh, surface. Also, there are some uh, features higher up in the, in the Pirgo stage, which um, are not reflected well one in the minute. carbonate curve. So now if we discuss a little bit the trends uh, in the offset between carbonate and organic matter, um, there are some significant spatial variations. What we see, there is a certain increase in the Dorabillion. There is a little bit of decrease or stable part in the, in the sand pin. And then again, some increase, which is quite nicely um, shown in two sections, but, but not in the deep water TAR2 drill core. Um, then some sort of local uh, events or disturbances in the, uh, in the patterns. And uh, again, uh, some stable interval higher up. So in general, what we can see is there is a broadly increasing trend in the offset between the carbonate and organic matter curve, which fits uh, rather nicely with the, with the global pattern that has been um, uh, published uh, by Edwards and, and others a few years ago. So it seems that this may be a, a global shift. Whether it is an uh, expression of oxygenation, uh, uh, it's another debate. Uh, indeed, a lot of uh, things happen during um, the time we see the main change in the offset. So there may be um, a bunch of factors that are uh, influencing this uh, 
um, these curves. Um, moving to the summary here and finishing up, uh, certainly the new data uh, shows quite, quite a number of interesting features. Uh, I think it's fair to conclude that uh, the data reveal mixed uh, signatures from global changes in carbon sequestration and environments, as well as basinal trends and, and locally induced uh, shifts that may be sometimes so significant that they, they mask the, the global trends. And this is, of course, only a start of our work to move forward from here. We are extending our study area and also we aim to include, uh, of course, other proxy indicators to, to be able to um, dig more into, into actual drivers of, of those events. So I'm afraid I, I didn't solve really the question, what is actually behind all those uh, different features of, of isotope curves, which means uh, there's still some work to do. And um, in coming years, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to Bernd Ron's talk and hope there will be a nice uh, extension of our IGCB project. So thank you. And I'm grateful to, to many colleagues and co-authors uh, uh, who have helped to to work with this data. So thank you. Thank you for this great talk. I'm afraid we have no time and um, I'm now switching over to uh, uh, Bertrand Lefebvre, who will tell us about what happens next. I'm looking forward to that as well. I, I hope it will be okay this time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay. So can you see and hear me? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yeah, well, wonderful. So uh, I would like first to uh, thank you, all the team of the Zoom in on the other vision for this very nice and successful meeting. So thanks, thanks a lot for having organized it in spite of very, very difficult and complicated uh, situation. So thanks a lot for that. Thanks a lot also very much for offering us this opportunity to say a few words about this project of uh, new project <laughs> on the IGCP project. So um, as you all know, uh, IGCP uh, 510, 503, 591, 653 have been or still are because uh, it's still there uh, for the last one, very successful meetings. And it's very important for all of us to keep um, exchanging together, to keep this uh, community. We all are working together and um, this new project, if it's accepted, would be a kind of successor of the ongoing uh, 653 uh, project. So uh, if it works, we plan to submit uh, our project before October the 15th, which is the deadline for submission. And we should know around April, probably uh, next year, if it's accepted. So it would begin if everything is OK at the end of next year. So uh, the main question we would like to, um, to, to tackle is to uh, address in our project um, uh, to fill the numerous knowledge gaps we still have um, we, in and around the uh, order vision diversification. So not only the diversification itself, but its roots. So uh, gaps in the preceding in period in the Fourier gene gap, which was mentioned by Dave earlier today. Also, what's going on just after in the salary and recovery. But of course, the bulk uh, of the project will be on the order vision where we still have lots, lots of gaps, data gaps, knowledge gaps, uh, regional gaps uh, in knowledge. And in many regions, we just need more data in Africa, South America, Central uh, Asia, Middle East, uh, Eastern, Southeastern Asia, Siberia. So we still have many blank or almost blank areas where we need more data for our curls, for our database and to better understand what's going on. So we will have a look at many kinds of gaps. Of course, the ones which are mentioned here, other ones, taphonomic gaps was mentioned earlier by Joe. Yes, of course, and many other gaps. The idea is really to, um, to, to get more accurate, more precise and more data for, uh, for our scenarios. So uh, we have identified several more gaps to look at. And um, we'll, um, we'll try to 
enhance collaborations and uh, research in emerging countries uh, and to go in places which have been less visited in recent years. So to go back into the field in these countries and to, um, to develop uh, field work, uh, educational outreach activities as much as we can. So our team, uh, it's eight of us. So uh, you, I think you know all of them. So Wen Wei Wang is from China. Oliver Tin from uh, Estonia. Beatrice Weisfeld, I think she's around. Hello. Uh, from Argentina. Uh, Radija El Hariri from Morocco. I think she's here too. Hello. Uh, Mansore Gobadipour from uh, Iran. Elena Raiskaya from Russia. Yves uh, Candela from um, UK, sorry. And uh, Bertrand Lefebvre with me from, uh, from France. So that's, uh, that's the team. So in the last 12 months, we've been discussed of uh, the plan, what we could do. Uh, and uh, we have now a schedule which is uh, settled for the next five years. So the plan is to, uh, if it's accepted, of course, to begin next year at the same meeting as the uh, very last ultimate closing one for the 653 would be uh, in Lille. So we could have a smooth transition with the new project. So to have a joint meeting all together and uh, feed excursions uh, in the other version of Belgium, Wales and Welsh borderland. So probably Thomas could say a few more words about this uh, meeting and excursions. So that's this will be the first meeting. So our in very first one. Uh, the um, next one would be in Morocco, in Marrakesh, with a field excursion to the Ordovician, of course, but a probably late Ordovician to go in the Tafilat and to, to see the, the new Lagerstätten and the, um, also the, um, I'd say the Ian um, uh, gla uh, glacial things. It's we have a very good glacial record in this part. And if we can also the, to the single Furiangian uh, locality, which is known in uh, anti Atlas. Uh, we have also contacted um, colleagues for various, various other events for the same year. So we're in contact with people from the 668 IGCP project to have a joint session in Thailand at IPC6, uh, looking, um, with a uh, feedwork in Thailand. We have, uh, we're in contact with Brenda for uh, the seventh International Congress on Trilobites and Relatives. So we could have a session there um, in, um, in Cincinnati at this meeting. Uh, this meeting was scheduled next year, but it was postponed because of the, um, of the COVID. It's the same for the brachiopods, which should have taken place next year, but which are postponed to 2022. So we could have a session there too. It will be in Germany, in Berlin. Um, the next annual meeting in 2023 would take place at the same time as the uh, next ISOS meeting. It will be in Tallinn, in Estonia. Uh, and of course, it would be a nice opportunity to uh, visit the very nice uh, exposures. Uh, we've seen uh, some pictures with, uh, in the background be <laughs> behind Holler just be, uh, before, and uh, also in St. Petersburg area. So we have already organized with the Geological Survey of Malaysia um, the possibility to organize a workshop in Kuala Lumpur and uh, visit uh, Malaysia. Uh, and if the schedule is respected, we don't know yet, but normally there should be the 11th European Conference on Echinoderms in Lyon. So again, we could organize a session on uh, Cambro Ordovician uh, Echinoderms or something like that. The next annual meeting would be in Cordoba, in Argentina. So again, uh, we invite you to uh, very nice field excursions in the Ordovician of uh, San Juan province, in the Precordillera. Pre Beatrice is here and she can say a few words to uh, better explain, of course, if you have questions. And the final meeting, the closing meeting, would take place in China, in Changsha, with also some very nice field uh, excursions around. We are also hoping to organize field work in, um, if it's possible, as so we, we can say, in uh, Central Asia, in Iran or Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. We can't yet know if it will be possible, of course, for different reasons, but we're working on that. We have lots of contacts with the people there and it would be a wonderful opportunity to go to these uh, places where we have gorgeous geology in the Ordovician, nice sections and polynome furnace. So we are looking forward to organize something there. So feed walk, so that's one of the places where we could go in Iran. So clearly we major focus for us would be feed walk. Uh, so it's in, in the frame, of course, of the um, uh, congresses we presented, but also through uh, other projects, through um, 
collaborations for everything uh, we, we can do and to also boost because um, it was something at least positive with this crisis it's possible to make uh, virtual meetings which are working uh, virtual workshops so the idea is not to replace uh, physical meetings we need to exchange to see each other to go in the field but more as a complementary an additional tool that would be available especially for students or for people from developing countries who don't necessarily have the money or the funding to go abroad for such meetings so it's an additional tool that we we think of developing at least one or two each year on thematic issues or methodological methodological issues to um, to concern as many people to to get in contact with as many people as possible and uh, last thing uh, as we're going to submit now the project in about one month a bit more than one month we will need support uh, from colleagues saying yes that's a good idea um, so just send us uh, an email to uh, what's well, a stupid name but it's funny to ddemograptus it's easy to remember anyway at gmail.com and said just once one sentence yes uh, i you have my support there because we need to, to provide a list of supporters and the more people will support this project the higher highest chance will have to be uh, accepted and funded and if you have any suggestions ideas things because we are still writing it so we still have you still have three four weeks to send us oh yes you should do that that's absolutely fantastic please try to do that of workshops um anything uh, meetings any offer please send it to us we can add it still in the project it's still time but do not wait too much before because after the end of september it will be quite finalized already so we are looking forward uh, your support we are looking forward to be hopefully accepted and then welcoming you in all these nice places um in argentina morocco europe uh, china and uh, hopefully uh, central asia in the next years and um, thank you very much for your attention and um, if you have any question do not hesitate to um, to ask thank you merci bertrand oh. <laughs> uh, so what do we do now christian it's it's yours to say goodbye or to uh, introduce you to us to the closing ceremony uh yeah i uh, honestly have not prepared anything <laughs> so uh, i can easily say uh, goodbye but i would say that um this has been great fun um it has also been a bit weird because we are across time zones and as we sit here now we uh, watch well that's all of us from from Europe, but the young was from Korea and the assist in Argentina and Farid in Beirut and many people in the US. So basically we are truly global. We are almost everywhere. I, I saw Ian the other day, or rather Helen, first of all. So there's also people from Australia. Um, so this has been a great success. I think we have uh, managed to uh, meet despite of this uh, um, lockdown or what you say um, and as Lisa said the other day on Monday we are, I think we had 200 people registered and we have all the time been somewhere between 50 and maybe 90 online so um, this has been great uh, everything is recorded uh, so you can go back and watch this on, on YouTube whenever you like if there are particular moments that you find particular funny you can see it again and again uh, <laughs> And um, yeah, then I have to say also, of course, that do remember that there's potentially two meetings next year. There's the one in Lille and there's the one in Copenhagen. Um, we hope to plan something in late May, depending on how the situation evolves. But uh, should the pandemic cease somehow, we basically mirror the program we had from this year. We still have all the funding in place, the, the, the funding bodies, Kalsberg Foundation and the Danish Geological Society, they still support us. So we still have funding for, for the keynotes uh, that, are, um, that were advertised. And we still have uh, the excursions to Öland and Bornholm plant and also Scania. Um, I don't know if there's anything else to say, but uh, yeah. I 
could of course just say that then I will uh, hand over the internet line to my kids. They are desperate for getting back on their PlayStations, which they have not been able to do for the last four weeks, four days, at, at many times a day. Um, but other than that, I think we should just meet again somehow. Maybe we should, within this network, do some uh, regular meetings until um, Bertrand get his project up running. That could be a good idea. Uh, I see Birger has raised his hand. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I've missed at this meeting is the possibility to make, give applauds. And under reactions, you can actually applaud. I don't know if everyone yeah. knows yeah. it. And I have herewith sent my applauds to you, Christian, for arranging this fantastic meeting. Really, really well done. Thank you. And, uh, Thanks. One more applause. Yeah. No, I see lots of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. I mean, applause. So I just took a screen dump of that. <laughs> but of course, I would like to just uh, also thank all of you, um, the moderators, uh, the keynotes, the co-organizers. Alicia, you have done a lot, as I said in the introduction on Monday, and you have. And today, you were even up at 6 a.m. Um, so, and all of the presenters, I think it's been excellent. And um, yeah. What not to like. It's been great. So should we um, do some breakout? We don't have an annual dinner, but we can make breakout sessions again and then people can hang out if they like. Um, and other than that, I think we should just finish off and hopefully see each other sometime in real life uh, soon. So uh, bye for now, I think. I will see if I have some success with this breakout session thing again. <laughs>